Good morning, everyone. Uh, this morning, we have a very uh, special guest, Jen Chosen Bays Roshi. Since 85, has been the teacher for Zen Community of Oregon. In 2000, 2002, she helped to found Great Bao Zen Monastery and is the co abbot. In 2011, she also helped found Heart of Wisdom Zen Temple in Portland. Oregon, and we owe boundless compassion from her husband, the uh, Hogan. I think uh, Ruben borrowed that, and so we've made it into a video. And uh, thank you so much, Jan. So, Jan, please. Yes, that's a, you've done a beautiful thing with that recording. I love that. We're going to have to imitate that. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming together. Uh, to practice together and to support each other in practice. This is the true meaning of Sangha. At Great Vow uh, Monastery, where I live, we're in the midst of a three-month ango. Ango means uh, to settle the mind. It's an intensive practice period from the time of the Buddha. We wake up here at 3.50 in the morning, and we have two hours of zazen, morning chanting service, 20 minutes of temple cleaning and then Oriyoki breakfast and the silent work period. And then we it, it would go through the day in that same way. We observe the liturgy of the hours by chanting three or four times a day. And we have a total of the, about four and a half hours of Zazen each day. And one week of Sashin each month, we begin uh, Rohatsu Sashin on Sunday. The, Session which commemorates the Buddha's enlightenment, as you all know. Our, our theme for this three month ango is gyoji. Gyoji means continuous practice. And it's a uh, fascicle that was written in 1242 by the great Zen master Dogen Zenji. It begins, on the road of Buddha ancestors, there is always unsurpassable practice continuous and sustained. It forms the circle of the way and is never cut off. Between aspiration, practice and enlightenment, there is not a moment's gap. Continuous practice is the circle of the way. The power of your practice affects the entire earth and the entire sky in the 10 directions, although not noticed by others or by yourself. It is so. This means that you, sitting at home, chanting together, listening to this talk, are the great road of the Buddha ancestors. Master Hong Zhu, who lived in the early 1100s, said, those who have descendants are called ancestors. You, sitting on your cushion or your chair or even on your couch, are both descendants and ancestors. You are descendants of Shakyamuni Buddha and all the women and men who practiced over the last almost 2,600 years and thus handed this practice down to us. 
You are the ancestors who keep the great road open so that generations in the future will have this wonderful practice to inspire and sustain them. And they will surely need it as they inherit the effects of today's wars, climate disruption, political craziness, the effects of the pandemic, and the work of ending the many inequities and injustices in our society. It is your earnest practice, your never perfect practice in this very moment that keeps the road of the Buddhas and ancestors open and keeps it available for those who wish to practice tomorrow, a year from now, a hundred years from now, or 2,600 years from now. Please don't underestimate the power of your practice. Don't evaluate it, just do it. Ruben asked me to speak a bit about the work of a monastery or the purpose of a monastery. Helen, is it possible for me to screen share a picture? Can you make me the host so I can do that, or co-host? I can do it later if we can't do it now. Oops, I can't hear you. Okay, let's try, I'll try a screen share. This is a statue that we have at the monastery that we call our Maria Canon. We don't actually know that it is a Maria Canon, but it has uh, aspects of both a Maria and Canon. And this is a picture of the monastery from the field above the monastery. We are one of the of only a few Zen monasteries in the US. Our purpose at Great Vow Zen Monastery is to offer a place of sanctuary, a place of refuge, a place of peace, and of continuous practice. People come here for many reasons. Young people often come to stay with us when they're trying to find their place in life, for example, after high school or after college. Some people come when the veil of denial that usually covers our understanding or realization of the imminence of death is lifted by an illness or by an accident or by the death of someone they love. Some people come for mind training because they have realized that it is their mind that causes their suffering and they want to learn how to train the mind in order to end that suffering. Some come for heart training because they want to work with the anger and jealousy that they have seen in the depths of their heart. Other people come because they want to live in a spiritual community and they want to live, learn to live harmoniously with each other and with the earth. The monastery is not a place to withdraw from the world. It is far from cloistered although during Sashin, we are cloistered. Uh, at pre-COVID, we hosted uh, often over 100 guests a month. And we have 24 acres of forest and meadow and large gardens and orchards that we care for, as well as an, uh, an old school building, which is now 70 years old and has 15 aging furnaces and 18 aging toilets and an acre of roof. And we are also very active in the small town, uh, in the community of the small town that is near us. Like Zen monasteries in Japan, we are permeable both to the environment, natural environment, and also to our community. We want to be available when anyone needs to come here. In describing the monastery, my husband Hogan, 
uses the analogy of a university. So at a university, come, some people come to take one class. Some people come here to take a, one retreat or one class. Others come to stay and plunge into the practice for a month or a year or 10 years. And some, some people decide that they would like to make this their profession and they become ordained like professors at a university. Currently we have six ordained, three postulants and eight other residents ranging in age from 19 to 75. During our summer program, we have a lot of college students and we may increase our population by 35 people. And we also have a temple in Portland. Now I'd like to switch and talk about the pandemic since we're in the midst of a pandemic which has caused so many changes in our lives, including this necessity that we meet in two dimensions on a flat screen. I would like to say a, words, a few words about pandemics. These are the words, this is normal. Master Shen Yang, uh, that was one of his mottos, this is normal. Whatever's happening, this is normal. But pandemics are normal. Most of us have lived in a dream time. It has been a time when wars have all occurred in some other country far away. Most of us have lived in a time of plenty, plenty of food, clothing, cars, electronic gadgets. To have this dream time interrupted by a pandemic, the necessity to wear masks, to quarantine, and the re realization of mounting deaths seems abnormal, but I'm old enough to remember the polio epidemic when we children could not attend birthday parties or go swimming in swimming pools. And I vividly remember the day my mother picked up the newspaper and cried in relief as she read the headlines that Dr. Jonas Salk had created a successful polio vaccine. If you read the history of epidemics in the world, you will realize that this time we are in is actually normal. Our Zen tradition comes from Japan. And so let's look at one epidemic in Japan, one of many epidemics in Japan. An epidemic of smallpox began in Japan in 735 and lasted three years. During those three years, it killed one third of the population of Japan, including royalty, including four brothers of the powerful Fujiwara clan. That three-year epidemic precipitated significant changes in the government, shortages in food, and shortages in labor. And the government responded, interestingly, this may sound familiar, by waiving taxes and offering people rural land if they would leave the cities and go and grow rice in the rural areas. However, it also led to the rise of Buddhism with Emperor Shomu supporting Buddhism and building Todaiji, which is the largest wooden building in the world. And inside it is the Daibutsu, the great Buddha. The emperor also built many other Buddhist temples throughout the country. Over the next 200 years, Japan continued to experience epidemic after epidemic occurring every 10 to 15 years. Epidemics at that time were, and now are, still normal. Maizumi Roshi, who was my root teacher at the Zen Center in Los Angeles, used to ask us, was World War II good or bad? It was like a koan, something that we pondered. We had to consider the horror of the concentration camps and the slaughter of millions of innocent people. But we also had to consider the aftermath of the war when those horrors led to the Marshall Plan under which our country helped to rebuild the countries of its former, former enemies. And the creation of the League of Nations and the United Nations and NATO and the World Court and the World Health Organization. These arose out of a realization of the interdependence, the heart of compassion which the pandemic can do too and has done. We are all in this together. And what happens in one country affects every country around the world. 
A few weeks ago, I heard Dr. Christakis, who is a physician sociologist at Yale, who has written a book about the current pandemic. And he spoke on NPR, so you know it's true because it was on NPR. He spoke about what accompanies all epidemics or pandemics. First, what accompanies all pandemics are lies. Lies including conspiracy theories, false cures, and denials of what is happening. Does that sound familiar? I have an article from a newspaper from the Spanish flu epidemic in 1917, 1919. And my mother was born uh, in 1919, my father in 1917, during that epidemic. And the headlines in the newspaper urged people to wear masks. Colleges were requiring all their students to wear masks. And some people were very upset about masks and even violent in their objections to masks 100 years ago. The same arguments. The second characteristic of epidemics is that they are characterized by social upheaval, outbreaks of violence, and eventually by lasting societal change. Even within our little Zen world, we have all realized that we will need to continue to offer online access to our events, even to Sashin. Our Sashin, which begins tomorrow, uh, we have the residents of the monastery, 18 people, and then we have another 35 people attending online from home. That's revolutionary. We cannot now know whether all the societal shifts that are occurring will be beneficial or not. Some will, probably some won't. The third characteristic that he mentioned of epidemics is grief. And I think that one of the saddest aspects of how our leadership in this country has responded to the pandemic is not to acknowledge or even to deny the grief we are all feeling. Grief for those who have lost their jobs. Grief for people dying alone. Grief for the healthcare professionals who are working overtime and in constant fear that they will unknowingly infect their patients or their families when they return home from work every day. Earlier this week, I attended an interfaith gathering of about 50 leaders from all the major world's religions. It was, of course, an online gathering. One of the things that all spiritual groups are seeing is that people all over the world are reaching out through social media for spiritual help. The Metropolitan of the Russian Orthodox Church, speaking from Russia, told us that they are now in Lent and Easter, a time when many people usually come to church, but they cannot. Because of COVID-19, he broadcast the Easter service live and over 50,000 people attended. 50,000 people attended. That wouldn't be possible to cram that many people in the church. The Anglican Bishop of Cameroon told us that so many people in Africa are feeling hopeless because they have no jobs, particularly young people. So the church is encouraging them to turn their minds outward and to help take care of other people, their neighbors, to reach out to their neighbors and to those who are worse off, often in rural areas, who may not even have clean water to wash their hands. They're also teaching young people in particular to enjoy living a simpler life. Because before the pandemic, many people spent so much time away from home. For example, in Malawi, where I used to live, many people go to work in the mines in South Africa and they're away from their families except for a few days a year. So now they can be with their families and they can work and play and pray together. They're also encouraging, encouraging them to find joy in a simpler life, to realize the blessing of not being able to indulge your momentary desire to 
to run out and buy a new pair of shoes or this year's iPhone. Those of you who have done extended periods of sitting or done session know how happy you can be with so little. How contented you can be with simply sitting, listening, eating, walking, and sleeping. There was a rabbi scholar at the conference who said something that struck me. He said, in times of great transformation, there are also great opportunities. However, we cannot know what will actually be the outcome. We can look to history, we can look to the past, as I just did, for some precedence, but truly we cannot know the outcome. And he said, true courage is taking action when the outcome is unknown. This has particular resonance for us Zen folks who sit with a heart mind of not knowing. Not knowing is our practice. We sit without being able to know the outcome, even in the next moment. You may have a moment of quiet mind, of luminous clarity, which you're enjoying, and then the mind that thinks it must talk to us all the time in order to keep us safe, jumps in and says, oh, this is it. We're close to enlightenment now, and the moment is shattered. To sit, just to sit. To sit because it expresses our innate Buddha nature, our innate original mind. To sit because we have fallen in love with our breath and fallen in love with the way the sunlight moves across the floor. As long as we feel that this is an abnormal time, as long as we resist the truth of what is happening today, we will suffer. And so will those around us. The Buddha advised us, and this is a very interesting um, piece of advice. Put aside clinging and grief for the world. To put aside grief for the world, that doesn't mean to be cold and indifferent. It means that we are able, because we have trained our mind through Zazen, to be clear about reality. And because we have trained our heart through loving kindness practice to be kind, that we are able to move into a situation like this pandemic and how, help however we can in whatever place we are in. This is normal. This is normal. It's like, a, I often say it's like a paramedic who arrives at an accident and can't start crying and saying, oh, this is so terrible, this should never have happened. How could this happen in the world? Or, or get angry and say, people shouldn't drive drunk. I'm not gonna treat somebody who drives drunk. The paramedic has to put aside everything and jump in and help whoever it is there, whatever the circumstances are. That's putting aside clinging and grief for the world and manifesting clarity of mind, clarity of action, and love for all beings. Then wearing a mask and social distancing and living more simply and forgoing the visits we long for, the in-person visits that we long for with our loved ones, all are acts of kindness, all are bodhisattva acts all are following the first precept of not only Buddhism, but all major world religions, not to kill, but to cherish all life. I often think how different the world would be if everyone kept just that one precept to cherish all life. Please, as you go forward from this beautiful time of sitting together, Remember Dogen Zinji's admonition. The power of your practice affects the entire earth and the entire sky in the 10 directions. Even if it is not noticed by others or by yourself, it is so. Thank you so much for your practice, for the courage to step forward continually into the unknown with open hearts and open mind.
Let us recite boundless compassion. Boundless compassion. Let us sit for the next minute or so. Thank you so much, Jan, for the 
book, you have brought us from back to the future. And, you know, just getting to know the world and almost like seeing the world from a new uh, worldview and realizing that uh, this pandemic is not the only time. And just looking back, I never realized there were so many pandemics in the past. And also for letting us uh, hear about the monastery, I'm sure a lot of people will be inspired to go and uh, visit one. one monastery in their life. Thank you so much. So I'd like to uh, open the floor to uh, anybody who would like to uh, say something or ask a question to Jan. Just uh, raise your hand or unmute yourself and I'll not like you. Yes, Maria. Yes, Jan, I also want to thank you so much for your always so um, encouraging talk. And um, of course, I was also part of this interfaith meeting that you mentioned. But before I say even that, I have to say that I spoke about you in one of my tea shows when I spoke about how difficult it was for me when the children were small and I couldn't really practice that much. And I came to two of your retreats and you really saved my life with everything you advised me on. So thank you for that also again. Now to this conference, um, I also had um, just for us to realize what um, people are um, coping with. So in our group, there was a Geshe who was a leader of a small center in London. And then he was made the leading monk of a monastery in India with 5,000 monks. And he told us that they have been on strict lockdown since February. So only the people who buy the food can even approach the monastery, but those monks even have to live outside. And there are many young boys in that monastery. And from February to now, they are starting to deal with you know, issues of depression and um, anxiety and so on. And he, as a religious leader, has to really encourage them. Light of hope that you were speaking about, being helpful. Or a Muslim leader spoke about how important it is for his community to do funerals and religious leaders would do that, but then they would get infected and die, but they wanted to be there for their community. So that's one aspect. And um, I just want to finish with, um, there was a beacon of hope in my old mother that I talked to yesterday. She has dementia and usually no sense of time. And I explained to her, you know, we are now in this pandemic. And when you were a little girl, there were um, bombs falling from the sky. It was the Second World War. And she remembered that. And then she said, how long haven't you been here? And I said, almost one year. And she was speechless. And then she could feel, I didn't even know she still had the concept of time. And then when I didn't really know what to say, she said, you know what? Don't worry, we still have the telephone. We can always talk on the telephone. So I thought that's the Bodhisattva right there. And I think for us all, it's so helpful to be just encouraged by these little things that people might say that we would not pay normally so much attention to. So to have my mother with dementia comfort me where I be the other way around. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Maria, and thank your mother. <laughs> Clear mind pops through once in a while, huh? <laughs> really comes to the fore. Yeah. You can ask about anything. I will try to respond. <laughs> yes, Valerie. Thank you, Helen. And thank you so much, Jan, um, for your beautiful talk. Uh, I've long uh, followed you and um, heard many talks over the years and so enjoyed also the chance uh, some years ago now to visit Great Vow and um, see the beauty and care and uh, compassion that emanate from that place. Um, and all of that, I just, of course, your, your words 
um, you know, or something that we'll take in and, and receive that gift, but most of all, it's your uh, heart that, that comes across and uh, really illumines. Uh, that is the greatest encouragement. So thank you very much. Thank you. And of course, I'm always training this heart. <laughs> I will tell you a cute story. <laughs> so I, I was in the airport. This is a few years ago. Uh, and I, I had my head down. I was reading. And uh, I noticed a, a, a woman walking by. I just saw her shoes. I saw her shoes and her feet. And immediately, my mind, just like that, my mind said, she shouldn't be wearing those shoes. <laughs> I thought, what? Who said that? <laughs> but I got to see judgmental mind, you know, just like slice itself in there instantly. And that's what our practice is about. <laughs> so, and to laugh at it, you know, not to feel like, oh, I'm a terrible person, but to realize this is what the mind is like. The mind is constantly trying to put us up on the top. And so that we're winning, you know, we have the gold medal, especially in this country, you know, and uh, just to watch that and to know that's the beginning of all the problems in the world, right there, separating myself from this woman, who of course has total right to wear whatever she wants. <laughs> I have another funny thing my mind does too, we have to know our mind habits. If, some, if I can't find something, my mind instantly says, somebody took it. Somebody took it. <laughs> and of course, it's never true. <laughs> it's, it's that I mislaid it somewhere. You know? <laughs> so I have to laugh at that too. And I think, it, you know, sometimes we try to find a reason. I think it's because my younger sister was always borrowing clothes from my closet and I I'd try to get ready for school and go to pick out an outfit that I wanted to wear and it was gone. And then she'd be wearing it, you know? So I think that's the origin because I, I wasn't deprived, you know, people didn't steal things. I've only, people have stole things from me a few times in life, but it's not like a theme. <laughs> but the mind thinks it's trying to protect us by saying these stupid things. And that's the beginning. That's the beginning of all of our division in this society and all of the inequities and all of the systemic discrimination and racism. It's just, and wars, it's the beginning. So we have to work here at the beginning here. You know, and what, this is the only one we can change. If we're realistic about it, we can vote. And that's really important to vote and write our Congress people and so on. And, and Participate in protests if that's appropriate, if that's your place to work. <clears throat> but, you know, um, if we really think about it, who can we change? If, if you take the person closest to you, like your parents or your children or your partner, and you think, okay, I'm going to change one important thing about them, how, like, you know, put the toilet seat down at night so I don't fall in the toilet. <laughs> or I was talking with my son about this and I said, do you have these little issues with your wife? And he said, oh yeah, she wants all the sponges to be put so that the scrubby side is up and the sponge side is down. And he said, I see no point in that, but I want the toilet paper to be put on the roll so it rolls off the top, not the bottom. So if you, you could work really hard to change something like that about the person closest to you and you can make them really miserable trying to do it and you could probably accomplish it, but you can't create a major change in even the person closest to you. So we have to be realistic. This is the person we can change and we have to work really hard at that. But as, as Dogen Senji said, that affects everything. I often think of us as like, a, a mass of bubbles, you know, and we're, say, we're the bubble that we see in the middle and then all around are these bubbles, other bubbles, which are other people and other creatures. And if this, and we're just made up of the intersection of all these other bubbles in the, in the middle is emptiness, beautiful emptiness, which means 
the possibility of changing. But if this bubble changes its size or its characteristics, all the other bubbles are affected. Everything else that it intersects with is affected. So even as, as Dogen Zenji said, even though you don't know it, your practice has a profound effect. And that's so encouraging. Jen, I have a question. Oh, I'm sorry, are you done? And, no, and then of course in the relative world, we do whatever we can, whatever our life has designed us to help in that way. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, uh, my question is uh, how important is uh, enlightenment in your monastery? Uh, we've had some individuals who uh, have left us mainly because of their frustration in working on their own uh, enlightenment uh, experience. But I always assure people that what is really important is the embodying of the practice, how you manifest yourself in daily life. Yes. Exactly true. I couldn't have said it better. <laughs> we had, I went, when, you know, Zen practice is fairly new in the U.S. And we, we jumped in feet first. And I know Ruben and Maria did this in Japan too. We just like, okay, I held belt, <laughs> bent for enlightenment. And we jumped in feet first. And we just worked really, really hard because enlightenment was our goal. Um, and that was, that was probably necessary in the beginning of the introduction of Zen into the West. But um, it, it set up enlightenment as this unreachable goal. You know, like there are things in the literature like um, swallow a red hot iron ball or climb a mountain that's, you know, a million miles high and covered with ice. And, and yes, practice is difficult when we really get down to what's going on inside this thing we call me. Um, but especially in the, in the Soto view, enlightenment, our enlightenment is manifesting continually. The fact that we practice means that our enlightened nature that has, is eternal and is part of our being, we are born from it and we will return to it, our original being, our original nature, our original mind, the great mystery, whatever you call it. We are born from it and it calls to us from inside. And that's why we come to practice and practice is manifesting it as best we can at the time. So we constantly encourage people not to give in to the inner critic, you know, that voice inside that says, you're not there yet. And look at you, you did a stupid thing. And you looked at that lady's shoes and your mind did this, you know, not, not to give into that. That's Mara in the, in, the, in the Pali Canon, in the sutras. Mara is the inner critic Ta and talks to the Buddha, attacks the Buddha even after the Buddha was enlightened. So that, that's a, a, a voice that we can't give into. We have to recognize it and say, hello, I know you're trying to help me, but you're not. Um, and, and just continue in faith. You know, faith is so important. And in, in Buddhism, we don't give people a list of things they have to believe in order to belong. Or um, we, we encourage people just to be curious and investigate and find the truth for themselves. But faith is important because you have to have faith that there is a path and it leads us towards enlightenment and that we can follow that path, that we are capable of following that path and of changing and changing into a person we are happier and happier to be inhabiting, if that makes sense. Hmm. And a person that we actually love, you know? We, we become our own friends. And we're never lonely if we're, we're our own friends. You know, and I, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a friend with me, but, but, I'm, but I'm not a perfect friend. Who wants a perfect friend? Who wants a perfect partner? That would be so horrible if your partner were perfect. 
Or if everybody else was perfect and you weren't, you know? <laughs> or you were and nobody else was. It's just a ridiculous idea. But our practice gives us the ability to transform into something we know works better in the world. Something that we're happier inhabiting, this temporary person. So to me, that's, that's enlightenment unfolding and it's continually unfolding. The other thing I say is, you know how disappointing it is to, re to reach the end of something, like the end of a book that you loved? Or let's say you, uh, you wanna buy a new car. So you undergo the search and you're looking for, look, you start noticing everybody's cars and you consult with people. What cars do you like? What color do you like? What, what the advantage of this car, that car? And you spend this happy month searching for a car, a test driving car. And you buy the car and you're so happy you have a new shiny car. And then, you know, it gets dirty. And then and the inside gets dirty. And then you get a little ding in it. And then pretty soon it's just a car. And then the search begins again for something else. So what we love is the search. <laughs> what we love is learning as we search. What we love is changing as we search. And so to, 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 to think as we naively did when we encountered Zen early on, oh, there's an end and it's enlightenment. And when I'm enlightened, everything will fall into place. I will balance my checkbook. I will be a perfect chanter. I will know how to do calligraphy and other artwork. I will be kind to everyone, you know, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> um, that's crazy, actually. It's, it's a continual unfolding, and isn't that lovely? Thank you. Yes. But people leave. Yes, people do leave. Um, so two things about that. When people first come to practice, often they're so relieved to, to find a place of inner calm. But then if they practice for longer, they start to see what's actually going on in this thing we call me. And they, they'll come to me and say, I've looked inside and it's not a pretty picture. And I say, congratulations, <laughs> you've taken the next step in practice. But some people run away from that. That's too much to bear, too much to witness. But you know, I've lived long enough that I'll have, I, just, I actually had a physician who practiced with us for maybe five years and then disappeared. And 10 years later, he came back and he said, you know, I've been practicing again on my own at home and I realized that everything you said was true. <laughs> and I'm like, thank you, Lord, that I lived long enough to hear this. <laughs> and he's now a, a, an ardent practitioner. So, you know, occasionally there are these little moments of realizing that people are out there still working on it. Yes, Jean. Hello, Jan, I'm in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. And I just wanted to thank you. That was such an inspiring talk right before we go into our Rohatsu as well, which is starting tomorrow. And um, one of the many things that your talk just brought to mind is, you know, my practice has deepened greatly since the pandemic because of the ability to connect with Maria Kanan on a much more regular basis. And I never would have thought that that would have been a result. And you mentioned that too, all the people in other faiths who are able to connect through technology. And, and I was heartened to hear you say that, you know, because I've always been long distance from the Sangha, that, that this should be maintained, you know, this connection. So thank you, your humor and your spirit comes through so, so much, so grateful. Thank you. And isn't it wonderful that we can reach out? We have people from all over the world who come to our sessions from Denmark and South America. And, you know, it's wonderful. I, ca I call this time jailhouse conversion. So my husband used to work in the prisons and there's this phenomenon where you get put in jail and suddenly you find Jesus, you know, which is great. But then often after you leave jail, then you get distracted again. And, um, this is the time of COVID conversion. And isn't it wonderful that people are, realize they need spiritual support, they need spiritual practice during this time. And then we'll see what happens afterwards. 
but I think a lot of this will continue. A lot of what's been um, manifesting in terms of enhanced outreach to people and enhanced ac access to many aspects of practice that many people couldn't do before. I think that will last. We have Jenny. I just wanted to let you know that I am so grateful for your talk today because it is a confirmation of what I have been looking. Uh, I was I got lost and due, and pandemic came and uh, back back to my seating again and uh, now it's just what's right here right now enjoying every moment and what you just shared of um, you know the reaching out uh, this is really like an awakening to be living life like how we supposed to live life you know when you sit you sit when you eat you eat when you walk you just walk and doing that continuously makes you smile and makes you joyful and it's just an enlightening uh reminder to keep sitting and keep breathing and i'm so grateful for that thank you yes so much. thank you you said it you said it so well thank you Anybody else? Uh, yes, Rosa. Unmute yourself there. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Talk was wonderful. Um, I have two questions, if I may. Uh, one, if you had to speak to your younger self at the beginning of your practice and you had to advise her on how best to manage this monkey mind, what would you say? Uh, I would say learn to manage the monkey mind. <laughs> so um, what, one thing I did is uh, the, the only instructions, practice instructions we got at that time, because Zen was so new, was sit facing the wall and follow your breath. Count your breath to 10, and if you lose track, start with the numbers again. I was unable to do that. So here's a person with many years of, you know, training, grad, uh, academic training, and I could not count my breath to 10. I just couldn't. And, but I knew it was really important to stay there and to focus my mind. So I became creative and I encourage all of you to become creative with your practice. If something's not working for you, be creative with it. And I invented ways to stay focused on the present moment, and including my breath. And I'm visual. So I did things like, I have hundreds of them, but I'll tell you a few. I did things like um, I would envision the numbers in glowing neon colors. So one, one would be yellow, a giant one. And then two would be orange and three would be red and so on through the rainbow and then start again. And, and that helped me stay focused. Another thing that I did was um, <laughs> count backwards from a hundred by sevens. <laughs> So the first breath would be 100 and then minus seven is 93 <laughs> <laughs> and so on. Uh, you know, I had just lots of them and some of them I have learned are classic um, old Theravada practices because the mind is the mind, you know, even to, to 2,600 years ago. Um, but I really encourage people not, not to be too constrained because the mind, you see, the mind is like a two or three year old child and it'll concentrate for a while. It loves novelty. Like, oh, let's do this. Let's do loving kindness practice. Mm -hmm. And then after a while, a few days, a few weeks, it says, okay, been there, done that. What's next? I'm getting bored. So then you just have to modify it a little bit, you know? And then the mind is interested again. So I just think, I guess that would be my advice. Continue to be creative. 
when unfortunately I followed that advice when I was young and learned to really concentrate very, very, very well. And then loved the feeling of the clarity of mind, the spaciousness uh, that that brought about through any means, <laughs> any legal means. <laughs> <laughs> Second question is, um, you are in a Soto tradition and our tradition is a symbol Kyodam. Um, can someone join you, uh, join uh, the <laughs> online retreats, even though uh, don't of belong? Course. Of course, of course. You know, the Soto Rinzai thing is kind of like Harvard and Yale, you know, we're better. No, we're not better. We're just a little, we're flavored a little different, a little differently. And, and that's good because not all people like chocolate and not all people like vanilla and not all people like strawberry. So find, find the flavor of practice and the teachings that, that works for you at this time. Yeah, no, anybody can join. We have a Catholic nun who practices with us regularly. You know, she says it's a very wonderful um, accompaniment for her prayer practice to, to serve. She came and lived at the monastery for a month. Wonderful person. So I think it's almost time. So before we do our uh, end of the uh, chanting, I would like to acknowledge the presence of uh, Rosa Bellino, who is in London, and she will be joining our session. So Rosa, can you please just introduce yourself, what you do and whatever you want to say, please. Um, thank you very much, Helen, uh, for allowing me to join today's talk, which I thought was so uh, wonderful. And what I, what I think I remember most about this talk is um, laugh at your mind, don't take it so seriously. Um, so I tend to take myself too seriously or my perceive not imperfection very seriously. So briefly, uh, my name is Rosa, I'm Italian, I live in London. Um, I have been a student of Sister Elaine, I joined in 1996, I just checked the other day, it's a long time. And I have been fortunate to study with uh, other teachers in the Sambu Kyodan, John Gena um, and Valerie. And uh, I'm very happy to be able to attend the first Rohat session uh, with you all. I don't feel very awake today because I've been sitting in Yaza till four o'clock this morning. <laughs> but I'm really happy um, to be uh, part of uh, this Sangha and I really look forward to meeting everybody, uh, even though online some of, of you are very familiar faces, Scott, Valerie, Helen now, and Maria. I, so um, it's such a blessing. I, I found more good things in this um, lockdown than negative things. Um, I think I'm lucky I still have a job, although part-time. So I just have much more time to enjoy sitting with sanghas in America or in England. So thank you, thank you again. And I look forward to meeting um, Ruben Abito. <laughs> and thank you for a wonderful talk. Thank you. Just well, let's, let's uh, prepare for our final chanting this morning.
the heart of the perfection of great wisdom sutra. Avalokiteshvara bodhisattva practicing the prajna paramita perceive the emptiness of all five constituents and overcame all suffering O Shariputra born is no other than emptiness emptiness no other than form form is precisely emptiness emptiness precisely form sensation thought impulse and consciousness are also like this O Shariputra all things are manifestations of emptiness not poor, not destroyed, not sane, not pure no gain, no loss thus in emptiness there is no form no sensation, no thought no impulse, nor consciousness no idea, no stone body, mind no color, sound, smell, taste, touch, thing no realm of sight, no realm of consciousness, no ignorance, no ending to ignorance, no old age and death, no ceasing of old age and death, no suffering, no cause of suffering, no ending to suffering, no path, no wisdom and no gain, no Bodhisattvas live this Prajna Paramita with no hindrance of mind, no hindrance, therefore, no fear, far beyond all delusion. Nirvana is already here. All past, present, and future Buddhas live this Prajna Paramita and attain supreme perfect enlightenment therefore know that prajna paramita is the great mantra the great bright mantra the supreme mantra the unsurpassable mantra by which all suffering is wiped away this is the truth without deception. Therefore set forth this Prajna Paramita Mantra. Set forth this Mantra and proclaim Gate, Gate, Paragate, Parasangate, Bodhisattva, Prajna Paramita Sutra. Four vows of the Bodhisattva. Sentient beings are numberless. I vow to free them. Delusions are inexhaustible. I vow to end them. The Dharma gates are boundless. I Sentient beings are numberless. I 
Once again, thank you so much, Jan. As a way of honoring her, let us do, uh, let us gush to her before she leaves. Yes, you should, we just wave our hands to say goodbye. Thank you. <laughs>